Good morning. We are live. And Jada, can you hear us in the room? Excellent. Well, perfect. Well, we'll get started here. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening to everyone joining us from everywhere. Um, we have a great panel today. And looking forward to our session. My name is Calvin De Souza, and I work for a firm called Crow, based in Toronto. It is not to chair this all-star panel of individuals from different geographies and businesses, and bring everyone together on this vital topic in front of us: our lost generations. As someone who's been in the workforce in the field of consulting and providing intelligence to business individuals over the last 15 years. I have witnessed a number of changes in both working and hiring. Pre-COVID, the linear path that people were able to take, such as getting a well-paying job straight after graduation, perhaps then starting a family and getting on the housing ladder, have gotten harder and harder to aspire to. In the COVID era, where certain hiring opportunities have diminished and maybe others have opened, a number of questions have arisen. How has remote work and studying affected the way people network and build relationships? How will the needs of employers and the skill sets of employees effectively complement each other going forward? How have poorer and richer nations experienced and will overcome the challenges ahead? Lots of questions and lots of room for fertile discussion. With that, I would love to call upon our panel to introduce ourselves and this great topic, starting with Heidi Kapari. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Heidi Kapari. I'm based here in Boulder, Colorado, in the USA. I um, my background is finance, entrepreneurship, technology, mentorship, and design thinking for solving the sustainable development goals. So had a background at UBS doing private wealth management for impact portfolios uh, and really was passionate about seeing how can we activate energy in the form of capital and also tools to address some of our largest challenges. And uh, I, I'm a systems thinker. So I love to see, um, look at a whole system and see how can we solve the problems of the folks in a system. And, uh, and I don't believe in polarization. I believe in unifying and really sitting and listening to all the challenges that people have and innovating together uh, for a system and a community. Uh, and so in 2015, when the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals uh, were released and it was the largest democratic process in history. And we had almost every country in the world actually agreeing on our goals, which was really exciting. Uh, and since then, we've seen a lot of companies and organizations organizing towards that. Um, I saw that the sustainable development goals were moonshot goals, really, right? These are major advancements for humanity. And so I took a step back. I'm also a mom. Uh, and I have uh, an, uh, a social entrepreneurship organization called Dream Tank that I started in 2016 to actually address this challenge, to unleash the best ideas on the planet to address the moonshot goals that we have and advancements for humanity. And um, and as a as a mom and prior to starting Dream Tank, as a mom, I was doing um, I was observing my children and how they were asking questions about the world. And I was doing all the social impact work. And I thought the questions that they had and the ideas they had were so much more exciting than a lot of um, the conferences I was going to, which were still very based on sectors, not a, a really out of the box approach. So I thought in 2016, let me try an experiment and see what if we worked with the youngest people and unleashed their imaginations and helped and invited them to help address humanity's biggest challenge with technology and their imaginations. And they're obviously um, digital natives and they actually know more than us how to use technology in a lot of ways. Uh, so five years later, um, we're expanding globally. We help uh, young people really have addressed lots of challenges, changed laws, and so many other stories I could share. But for now, I will pause and say, I'm so happy to be here and talk about this topic. And I'm really passionate about not, not 
letting the world go back and school go back to business as usual and really learn from what we've learned here now um, and evolve um, how we're supporting the next generation. So thank you so much, Heidi, for that excellent introduction. And I will now pass on to our panelist, Dr. Hind Abu Nasser Kasser, for her introduction. Thank you, Hind. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me today. Uh, I'm very honored to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, I work mainly on uh, globalization impact on policy reform. Uh, I have taken several role in government and private sectors. I support the Ajman government for everything related to education, empowerment. Uh, I worked uh, for a time with the United the UNGC 22 for the sustainable development called implementation. And uh, sp I'm a speaker for the youth empowerment. I'm a member of the Women Arab League Parliament. And uh, I have led a lot of projects related to education reform in the UAE, in Lebanon, and uh, hopefully in uh, Ghana very soon. Uh, I have worked on uh, the moral education, the tolerance, uh, the projects that really touched uh, the youth. I am a member of the task force in the Vatican, and we work on uh, really the security for food, for uh, youth, uh, for career, uh, for even jobs. Uh, and I am a director of the Jobonomics, uh, which is a new business startup approach for the Arab region. And uh, I am as well... Um, uh, a social media advisor for the youth awareness. And uh, uh, I work very closely with the women empowerment in Ghana with the APN network policy. And uh, here I uh, I am in charge as well of uh, the security of the women and the children. And uh, we have a lot of initiatives. Um, and uh, yes, technology is very important in the region. Uh, and this is why throughout the education reform, uh, we are working closely with uh, with the G German patent uh, artificial intelligence machinery that really advises with the talent management and uh, support career choice, employment within the same institution and really empower youth. Uh, that's a quick and uh, uh, back to you, Calvin. Thank you so much, Dr. Hind. Um, and now we have Lucas Ferratides. Hi, Lucas. Hi. Um, first of all, I'm very honored to be in this panel with all of you, and uh, I really appreciate this uh, invitation. And a um, quick introduction about me. I am just 23 years old. I just graduated um, last month, actually. So I can quite relate with the title of our Lost Generations, because I am currently experiencing some of the issues that come uh, uh, due to the overqualified candidates, due to COVID-19, and several other issues in terms of uh, socioeconomic, which we will later discuss. And um, actually, when I was just 17 years old, I started Lean Start, which is a startup accelerator for high school students. And it aims to educate, empower, and uh, show uh, youngsters how they can turn their ideas into businesses or how they can find ideas, actually, and how they can continue in order to create a team, in order to learn how to pitch, and later on, um, raise initial capital. Um, because this is an issue I experienced when I was younger. And I believe entrepreneurship can really solve a lot of the problems that our lost generation is experiencing at the moment uh, by finding innovative ways to solve um, problems within the society. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lucas. And finally, last but not least, Jarvis Chen. You have the mic. Jarvis, you'll have to unmute yourself, please. Hi, sorry, I just forgot to unmute myself. So hi, hello everyone. Thank you very much indeed for the introductions. Um, so my name is Jarvis Chen. I'm based in London, um, the UK. Um, so, uh, you know, I just run the family business of our UK branch um, um, just on a daily basis. In fact, I've run the business since the end of 2016. So our main focus is um, on, you know, how to help our international clients, you know, uh, managing uh, uh, international operations across the globe. Um, so, um, so we're mainly focused on uh, setting up and managing 
um, companies of our, for our clients, and we also arrange for you know uh, you know logistics across the world for our clients, you know, for imports and exports. Um, so um, prior prior to you know um, joining our family business. Um, so I was um, working for a number of banks in Hong Kong and London. Um, so my um, so my expertise, you know, um, is you know um, is to integrate you know finance, you know, with all kinds of businesses um, in our life. You know, especially uh, some of the businesses um, run by the younger generation. You know, which kind of relates to our topic today. Um, so come, uh, I'll just hand over to you, Kelvin. Thank you so much, Jarvis, and some great material there and lots, lots of points of discussion. And so uh, we're going to get straight into it. And Heidi, I'm going to start with you. The topic, our lost generations, the phrase our lost generation sounds a bit maudlin, you could argue. But as someone who helps young entrepreneurs fulfill their dreams, how have you found that COVID-19 and the pandemic has changed the way you approach unleashing innovation and creativity in the people that you work with? Well, it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something that might be a kind of a shock and probably not to people here. Um, but due to the pandemic and, the, you know, the, the youth who have been, you know, trying to learn during this time offline, online, um, what I have seen is, and, and what's been going on with the leadership in the world. Um, these young people were so connected to the news cycle and knowing what's going on almost every day. So they had traumatic things coming at them every single day. And then they were forced to go back in, squeeze into like a Zoom screen or Google Classroom to go do the same kind of learning that they always did in this online format with barely any acknowledgement from the administrators that the world had changed. Uh, and, and so as the time went on, I could see young people losing more and more faith in authority, in leadership, and their, their teachers became less relevant. The leadership became less relevant. They just started checking out and saying, adults don't know what they're doing. Why should we listen to anything they have to say? You know, look at how they don't even take, take, you know, there's so many different in different countries, but especially in the U.S., there's been so much, so much, uh, you know, polarization. There's been so much like trauma after one after another. Also here in Boulder, we had a shooting. Right. And then they go back to school as usual. And the, it's very frustrating for young people to see that we are not taking into account what's going on in the world in their education. And so I'm worried, actually, that when we go back, we're going to have more depression. I mean, suicide has gone through the roof. Depression has gone through the roof. And now we're going to try to make them go back to things and keep the same education. That's totally not serving them and i and what i'm seeing and how we've learned to adapt and because we've listened we worked with 40 young people as fellows last year between the ages of 12 and 28 all online and different ways that we were collaborating so what we've learned is that the best way to actually serve them is creating situations for them to be a hundred percent self-motivated so that they don't have to listen to us anymore. <laughs> and we just support them with the technology and the mentorship and get out of the way. That is how we have changed things. So what we've developed is an online virtual headquarters that's gamified. So it's not like Zoom. It's not like Google Classroom. They can actually, it's like a virtual building. So they have a lot more fun and engaging and it'll be self-motivated. So they get badges and points. They want to learn to go on to the next level. Nobody's telling them what to do anymore. Uh, and, and that has radically also changed because before, while we were always focused on unleashing their ideas and helping them, there would at some point be, okay, well, these are the steps that would be good to take to execute this. But the second it started feeling like we were telling them what to do, they tune out. 
And as I noticed that in the past year more than ever. So we have radically adapted our programs. We're now we're, and we're also building a full on game with AI, blockchain, um, you know, Pokemon Go meets Ready Player One meets a big global scavenger hunt to solve the sustainable development goals developed by youth for youth. So they're going to design their own education that's gamified, that actually translates to money in the real world. And so that's how we adapted. And, and it's interesting because, uh, and Hind, I, I would love to follow up on you, actually, because you have uh, done a lot of work with the sustainable development goals and also have designed online curriculums and training. How has your experience over the last year changed and how have you how have you had to shift some of the curriculums and the way you sort of consult? Um, uh, first, I would like to uh, to clap again verbally uh, to Mrs. Heidi. This is very inspiring. Actually, this is what you call a recycling of energy and time and uh, talent. It's when the youth are working for the youth uh, because they will know their vocabulary. They will know their terms. And um, I would like to um, to share this experience. What is do, what we are having now in the region is we are revisiting, revisiting everything. We are revisiting the profiles, the profiles of every single employee, starting from education. In the fourth education and forum that was organized by the UNECO uh, one week back, uh, I will share uh, what the Finnish educators uh, has shared with us that within a technology-based um, society. What we are now envisioning is teachers that are moving towards vision, creativity. And this is something that uh, was not before. Teachers are now invited to be even entrepreneurs. They're not now invited only to go and teach. They are invited to be in the entrepreneurship mindset. I am not here only to teach these students, but to attract new students. I am a part of this institution and I will be putting a lot of effort into the growth of this institution. So this is at the teacher's level. When it comes to employability um, skills and all of these uh, employees that are within organizations, we have as well changed the profile. We are more into the soft skills than before. We, uh, Like I shared with you earlier to this uh, webinar, uh, Technology and knowledge will get you into the interview, but the job you will get it through the soft skills. And the seven habits of uh, Stephen Coven. Um, and again, which is the last thing I would like to share, we revisited the values. When you have here values that are questioned by sitting on the Zoom, and by being so independent and not listening to a leader or a teacher, we are here invited to revisit our social values, our norms, our practices, social practices. And this is something that is really connected to the sustainability goals. Sure. Thank you so much, Hind. And, and the last point, which is the policies. Yeah. Because really, I, I design policies as well here in the regions. We have two big policies that are now trending, and we are working hard on them. The first one is communication. The second one is public-private collaboration. We have now came to a point where we realized, because of the COVID, that we cannot live alone, including the governments. And this is my role now with the government of Ajman this private-public um, collaboration. It's amazing. And, uh, uh, and a quick shout-out to everybody in the room for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for everyone for joining us. And, and, you know, we will have time questions for all of you. So feel free to, uh, you know, press your manage the mic and I can come to you. But Heidi, you had a quick point or a question. So I'll yes. Ask my yes, the public-private collaboration, that is everything. Um, that is everything. Uh, it is. It is like imagine, you know, you're you're going on a, a mission uh, to a, a achieve a major change for humanity um, and reverse engineering into who needs to be on your superhero team. We need a funder. We need a we need a legislator. We need 
artists. We need it's it's really an orchestration of all the different gifts that people have. And that it's very inspiring if it, you know, I think the next generation should be and hopefully is uh, is our reason to drop our walls and jump through hoops to solve problems together across sectors, public, private. And um, we have the game that we've, the game that we are developing that my 12 year old son is actually helping design is called Island 17. Uh, and so 17 meaning the, the partnerships for the goals. And, um, and the only way we can actually achieve uh, all the sustainable development goals is through partnerships. That's the premise of it. Awesome. Thank you, Heidi. And again, so many amazing points there. And one of the things that uh, that you talked about, which I couldn't agree with enough, was the difference between hard and soft skills and how they get you through the employment and in interview process. And, and with that, actually, I kind of wanted to bring uh, Lucas into this conversation because, uh, you know, it's amazing to have you on the panel as someone who has just graduated this year, who started a business and who has kind of, I guess, come through the ranks with various people in, you know, in studying in, in, in a COVID year. How was your experience in, in graduating during the COVID pandemic? And what do you think were some of the biggest challenges that people had in your peer group in seeking employment, mentorship, development of soft skills that, that he talked about, for example? Um, first of all, I think... Uh, what many people might get wrong is that many think that COVID has made change in how the world works. But in my opinion, COVID has um, made us fast forward 20 or 30 years because now we're implementing practices that would have taken much more time to do. For example, um, online interviews for jobs or graduate schemes or internships. They were um, very time wasting in terms of you have to commute in London, you have to go to the company, you have to spend 12 hours in the company, you have to meet everyone. And now how things are, are much more efficient in terms of uh, time and capital invested from companies. But I think it lacks the personal touch of actually meeting people, um, creating rapport and things very simple. So it's just having coffee with someone who is interviewing you and getting to know them in depth and not just from the screen. And I think what many people have found difficult seeking employment at the moment is that they cannot create this personal touch. Although you can do it up to a point online, you will still lack uh, some some things. For example, if you're a very good public speaker, of course, you can translate that online, but you will never get the 100% full experience of actually understanding how good someone is. And I think on the other part of the recruiter side, it's also challenging as well because they only see one side of the person from the digital screen where you can easily give different perspectives of how someone is actually working. And uh, for example, I was just recruiting for the summer internship we launched for my company, and it was quite challenging actually understanding how a person interacts and how well you would be able to work with them by just interviewing them online and giving them online tasks. So, so I think although COVID there has brought several issues within the whole recruitment process in our lost generation, it has also brought some things into consideration for the near future where the, the world is slowly returning back to normal. That's, that's very interesting. And picking up on that kind of geographical point of view and having, you know, having to go places, say, to London being the center of everything for an interview, um, I would like to actually bring Jarvis into this conversation. And, and Jarvis, you've worked in banks across the world for the firm that you, the family office that you work with has offices around the world. Could you give us a sense from a sort of global perspective, how you found hiring, employability, uh, and how things have changed at your end? Oh yeah, of course. Thank you very much for, uh, for the question. So I think one of the major concerns, you know, even before um, the pandemic struck um, was, um, you know, uh, small businesses, you know, were unable to, um, to apply for um, loans, you know, from, from major banks, especially for, for those firms run by the younger generation. So you had, you had to jump through, you know, all different kinds of hooks. You know, you had to go through credit, credit checks. You had, you had to go through, you know, all the draconian paperwork in order to, to, um, to, um, to get a loan, um, just, you know, to, to get your business 
going. Um, so in comparison, I'm you know just at the height of the pandemic, for example, in the UK. So the 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 UK government um you know, issued lots of you know government back or government uh you know uh you know for given uh you know um loans or grants um you know to to big corporations you know based in the UK so, um I'll give I'll, I'll give you guys one example um so last year just at the beginning of the pandemic uh you know which was um uh um at the at, 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 at the beginning of um, April last year, um, so one of the bakery chains, um, you know, based in London, um, received you know a government uh, loan of one hundred fifty million pounds, you know, at a mere interest of zero point three percent per annum. You know, I, I think I think that is a that is a staggering figure. So, um, you know, um, you know, for the younger generation, and um, you know, to look into, um, just like I mentioned, you know. A lot of people, especially the younger generation, um, have been unable to apply for government loans or like you know uh, ordinary uh, loans from banks. You know, but those big, um, you know, corporations, you know, are are not you know are not just you know falling through the cracks. You know, I think I think I, I think at the end of the day, you know, the, the younger generation suffer a lot. For sure. Thank you very much. And Hen, please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chen, because you have brought up a very crucial point, which is finance. Yeah. Finance is key to entrepreneurship. We yeah, have that is key. yeah, that is the key to, um, to, to running a business, you know, Yes, um, I think I think one of the one of the one one of the major concerns is that you know the governments across the world, you know, I think they worried about unemployment and uh, unemployment rate just you know spiking up just you know in the wake of the pandemic. Um, so as a result of that, they have doled out so much money to those big corporations, you know, which in turn, you know. Um, you know, um, you know, have you know flown into the stock market uh, all over the world. You can see, you know, um, the stock market, you know, worldwide, you know, have been booming like a rocket. That is, you know, I think, I think that is the tax, um, that is crazy, you know, in my point of view. <laughs> Uh, so uh, I will, I will uh, take uh, uh, what Michael Khaled has um, has wrote in his book, Think Smarter. Yeah. Uh, he said that we are not building our skills to go and to get a job, but maybe to create our own. So um, sometimes in most of uh, the career advisory and the career counseling, most of the fresh graduates are really afraid because they say, I don't have work and maybe the robots are going to take my job. But when the robot is going to, to take from us some tasks, we are creating new jobs. Let us. Uh, let us, for example, when did you hear about cryptocurrency miner or digger? <laughs> what? So, so these are new uh, jobs that did, they were not there before yeah. a certain period of time. And I'm not going to take the COVID as a, a line in the turning history because I, I agree with um, uh, with uh, with my fellow here that. Um, um, Again, I, I forgot the name. I'm sorry. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Luca. Okay. Luca, yes. Yeah. Uh, so um, I will agree with him, yes, that the COVID actually did not do anything except only it gave us a microscope lens or a big lens to see more uh, bigger what has been there. And I always, when I go to a certain speech, I tell them, we really waited for the COVID to check for the special needs? Did we wait for the COVID to see that people really, when they are in their education tracks, they need to be in a positive well-being and a learning environment? Did you wait for that? So there are some formulas that were here trended. I consider them business-oriented. Sure. And we need we need really to stop thinking education as a business and think education as a tool for growth, tool for building minds for the future. And this is where the sustainability framework comes, where you have all of these goals together. When you achieve one, 
you are achieving all of the others. You cannot achieve one without the others. And uh, that's my point. I will, I will leave you the floor because I saw Heidi raising the hand. Yes, Heidi, over to you. <clears throat> I want to, I feel like there's a lot of reframing that we could really do around using even words like job. Uh, I think that job needs to be retired as a word <laughs> um, because it, it, it implies that you're doing something that you wouldn't normally be doing if you weren't getting paid. Right. So and so wouldn't our, and as we've learned is that our lives are in our work. Right. And that we've for so long have been asked to externalize our lives to go to work. Right. Um, how many times you have to tell your kids or people around you, sorry, I have to go do this. And you you we use jobs and business as an excuse for actually bad behavior and not showing up for people in our lives, right? Like you know, how many times people use words like, um, oh, sorry, I'm, I didn't mean to do that to you. It's just business, right? Like we, that means that you are treating people badly and you're using business as an excuse, right? Or you're not showing up in your life for, or for others and you're made to feel guilty for that, right? And so what I love seeing actually is people standing up and saying, no, we don't actually want to go back to work as usual. We want to have our lives. And so what I think a lot of us can do is that we hold this standard, especially with those of us working in entrepreneurship and finance, right? Is that we, those industries, while successful in many ways, nine out of 10 entrepreneurs, uh, businesses still were failing, right? And attached to that with both of those types of careers is a burnout culture, right? This burnout culture is so the badge of honor to never sleep and work. No, we can't do that anymore. We have to bring our lives into, into our purpose and our mission. So I think all those words and these types of conversations, if we reframe them, we're bringing our lives and our passion into making money, doing something we love that makes the world better is going to create world peace because you don't point fingers at someone else. If you're fulfilled, if you're happy, if you're doing something you love and you're, you've learned how to make money doing it, there are infinite number of jobs that career counselors, the, the job, it's not what job do you want? It's what lights your heart up with joy. And then let's help you build, build a whole life around that. So I just wanted to share that because there's some things that we're carrying from the old world into the new. And I really see it um, evolving in a beautiful way. And all of us, I really believe, need to take a stand for that, uh, especially for our youth, because they see the silliness that we've been doing. So, uh, so yes, thank you. Yes, uh, such an amazing and uh, a couple of really good points there that I just want to highlight uh, with, you know, with the word job, as you pointed out, Heidi, and then as Hind as well pointed out that we aren't necessarily kind of applying for jobs, we're creating them. Uh, and, you know, who knew, as you said, you know, um, cryptocurrency miner or I guess virtual panel moderator, but bringing Lucas into this. I'm kind of curious, you actually are kind of, you know, a, a model for this, actually creating your job versus sort of applying for one. How did you kind of come across onto this path? Um, so there is two points on this, because uh, when I started my company, I was just in high school. So it was not possible kind of to work at the time. But now that I'm graduating, I'm seeing how the um, whole employment industry is and how it works. I see many gaps and I don't feel like I want to go into this um, into this road. And I think Heidi wrote a very interesting point about uh, burnout, which is a word we didn't use that much in the past. And we've seen too many articles of uh, many banks, many big corporations. I don't want to name names, but uh, that uh, they were talking about how they are working 100 hours work week. But this is not just during COVID. <laughs> this was every time. But uh, now COVID is a good um, way to, for employees to express themselves and to say, you know, we are working too much. Our job is our life and uh, we need some balance into that. And I've seen that how many companies want to bring on the C-level executive positions, people who will be working on the, 
on the inner peace of their uh, employees and in order to keep them not only happy, but also satisfied with the work they do and to have a balance in their life, which is quite interesting at this point. And it's a good turning point for uh, employees. Yeah, I couldn't agree enough with the with the sort of move that, you know, I, I think 100 hours being in the past a badge of honor. I mean, it, it, it took a pandemic for us to sort of realize that there is something called a work-life balance. And I think Jarvis, I'd love to bring you in on this point as someone who worked in finance and, and banking for for a while prior to your to your current sort of setup. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on, on sort of burnout and, and this perspective? Please, please unmute yourself, George. I just forgot to unmute you just one more time. Thank you very much for your question. Um, so I think I think coming back to um to um let me just uh, just coming back to uh to Lucas' question, just you know on um, just you know balancing our life, just you know um, just in the aftermath of of the pandemic. I think a lot a lot a lot, a lot of people, especially you know parents, you know. Are not willing to come back to business as usual. Um, you know, they don't want to work. Uh, you know, uh, from nine a.m. to five p.m. Um, so a lot of people, you know, they have, you know, they have um, some family responsibility um, to look after. Um, so I think, I think, I think firms um, 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 should have like a flexible policy. You know, um, so for which it um, it allows um, you know uh, employees, you know, to choose. Um, you know, either they work from home, either they work from the office. You know, um, I think, I think, I think that would be, you know, the ultimate solution. Um, just you know, um, for us to get out of the pandemic moving forward. And and on that perspective, and and Hen, it's it's perfect because I was just going to bring you into this point as well about flexible working. I think there's been a lot of literature written about how the pandemic has had a really harder effect on women than it has men in terms of, you know, their impact on sort of education, being able to have, a, you know, a work-life balance of any sort. And you obviously are, you know, very much at the forefront of, you know, of, of, of women's empowerment and sort of, you know, both in the education and in the entrepreneurial perspective. Could you give us your thoughts on, on, this, on this issue, Min? Okay, uh, I'm taking some time on muting. So, uh, very interesting point because here we are talking about the social structure that is coming back. Maybe we have evolved in the way we are thinking. We have evolved in the way we are processing. But unfortunately, we have came back to the old structure, which has positive and negative positive when we when we talked uh, um, about uh, parent involvement and this is something really that I admire when you work a family business this is something that reflects values reflects norms you are part of the family you are keeping the legacy the COVID-19 has made these pa all our parents and even myself as a parent I have three kids more involved into the life of our kids and putting back the priorities but unfortunately as a woman I had to take over work and house more often and on the depend of my work and I was pushed towards this work and life balance without knowing here in the Middle East we work maybe uh, unstoppably we are all workaholic man or woman we work, we have high KPIs, we have high de de demands. And this is something that I brought up in my own doctoral thesis, that we are pushing these youth towards KPIs, towards demands, return on investment. You have to bring money. You have to do this. You have to do that. And then later on, you ask them why they are depressed. You are putting too much on their table. And you are not leaving a time for them to be creative. You know, my own students, when I see them working, I do not believe that because I know that this person used to be very lazy, but very creative, very fun. And then when I go and visit them in their organization and I see them with all these black panda eyes and then working and working and not really having a time to, to have a chat of 15 minutes, um, I'm a, li a little bit surprised. So... 
this is why when we are thank you lucas one second so this is why when we are pushing towards entrepreneurship when you are creating a job that you love when you are creating something that you wish to do to serve the community and not to earn money you are not here you are not built to have money you can have money from everywhere but when you want to serve the community you will do it with passion and with love and this is something that i really encountered what when i created uh, my own uh, uh, company seeds i had a lot of like you said heidi this kind of self blame because i want to work with values i want to work by earning a certain remuneration that i will call but i do not want to compromise what is the formula you yes. do not have a clear formula where you can have your social values that create the business and not the business that will create its own social values you don't have it you need this by itself is a reform <laughs> yeah. by itself <laughs> For sure, and 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 thank you. In in the last five minutes, I'm just going to quickly call upon Lucas before we get Heidi to to have the final words. Lucas, um, I found this very interesting what he was saying because um, when I am talking with my fellow graduates from London, I I always hear the same thing, which is I'm not sure if I want to work in this company because they're working not only too much, but If I will work for them, I will just do it for two or three years because then I can't imagine myself doing this forever. And I think our values have shifted from working for a company for our whole lives and being internally promoted to now switching from company to company in order to get a higher salary, higher bonus, or um, in order to be uh, getting more promotions, essentially, to be going from associate to an, from an analyst to an associate to VP to MD. And I think this has switched our uh, values in how we are working. For sure. And hey, feel of, uh, you yeah, had uh, only one thing. Yeah, you sure. know the brain, because because I my 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 basic major is biology, so anatomy. The brain cannot function healthy in a healthy way if you are in a job more than five years. And this is why when you see a resume, and this is this is something that you learn by time. When you see a resume, if you see that this person was more than five years in a company, you will know that he's burned out already. And he's not going to perform in your organization or in your entrepreneurship or whatever the institution. Because finish, he has lost it. The first year, adapt, uh, you know, he will know the organization. The second year, he will adapt. The third year, he will be expanding, giving, giving more. The fourth year, he will have more ideas because he has experience. But the fifth year, he has to go out <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes uh, and, 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 and talking I about going that. out uh, I talking about that. going out uh, uh, Heidi I would, I would love I'd love you to sort of take us out <laughs> I love that yes okay so so I just I'm really grateful for everything everyone is saying here and I I think um the formula is um i want to and i want to before actually before i say that i just want to give a shout out to my fellows we i have uh four different uh young people between the ages of 21 and 23 who are actually leading different aspects of our company and are taking all of our past curriculum and plugging it into now um into what they need now so i think the formula that i found is first igniting that divine spark that what is that thing that you're here to do right like and the and one indication of that is what makes your heart light up with joy and and then what is that thing that you're doing whether it's painting swimming whatever that is and then matching what what do you want to solve in the world what do you, what do you want to make better in your life or your community in the world and then combining those two and then launching something from that with that future vision of what is what do I want the future to be and 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 so it's really um, igniting the human spirit and and allowing everyone to do what they're here to do and it doesn't fit into these jobs and all these predefined things anymore and the companies have to evolve 
Companies must evolve. Young people do not want to work for companies like you've said. They and and what we I want to do is give them a stand to say they have the power to say how they want things to be. Um, but they don't have to rail against anyone. They can just lead by example and just launch amazing things that blow our minds. Uh, so we can all believe that we can really design a thriving future together. So uh, I don't see them as a lost generation. I see them as as the you know the light uh, the light generation, not lost. Um, and and they are feeling lost because they don't see our commitment as a whole and as a society. And so that's our our job here. If we use the word job, our job <laughs> or mission, mission, should you all choose to accept it, is for us to all stay together to support them. Thank you so much on that bright and optimistic note. Thank everyone for an amazing discussion. And we will definitely continue this going forward. Thank you for everyone in the room for joining us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Bye. Bye.